in a way, I you know, I sum, summarize it, the most, the best case I came across, I mean, the almost unbelievably perfect case was Nietzsche. And Friedrich Nietzsche is famous for his statement that God is dead. But really what it meant was that dad is dead for Nietzsche. And therefore he looked for a substitute for God. His father represented God. His father was a minister. And he was very close to his father as a young child. Uh, but his father died, got sick and weak and very weak for a while and then died when Nietzsche was about five. And he looked for a substitute for his father all his life. And he, the substitute that he found was the, you know, the Superman, the Übermensch. That's finally the man that he could say could replace his father and replace God. Uh, because his father, although he loved him, was weak, physically weak, and died. And he never had any father substitute. So it was very interesting to see how Nietzsche represented the, the case, perhaps in the strongest way. Mm -hmm. that, so that's what I say, you know, he, it's not God who's dead, it's your dad who's dead. Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And I'm so excited to have a very special guest with us, Dr. Paul Vitz. Welcome, Dr. Vitz. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, I've been raving about your book on Twitter, uh, Faith of the Fatherless. Mm -hmm. I just stumbled across it uh, recently um, doing some research. And I just thought it was extremely fascinating. And I definitely am excited to talk about it today. Um, for those who don't know who you are, can you just give them a little bit of background about, um, about yourself? Okay, um, I'm a senior scholar professor now at uh, a new small university called Divine Mercy University. For many years, uh, over four, uh, yeah almost 40 years, I was a professor at New York University. That's in New York City, of course, and YU as it's known. And uh, now I've been down here in Northern Virginia at Divine Mercy for the last 15 years or so. Uh, I was, was trained in psychology and experimental and cognitive psychology uh, quite some time ago now at Stanford with my PhD. I was an atheist at the time, a skeptic and atheist. And uh, I was trained, as I said, in cognitive and experimental psychology. And I converted, of all things, to Christianity and also became a Catholic sometime later in the 1970s. And since then, I've been, in addition to my old time interests, I've branched out very strongly into the relationship between psychology and the faith. And so I've been writing on that topic now for quite some time. That's awesome. And I am so fascinated uh, by that connection between um, psychology and faith, uh, because I'm, I've just noticed when we're engaging people, so much of it has to do with not necessarily their objections um, may start logical, but if you dig a little deeper, it's an, an emotional aspect to it. Um, and so not saying that this is all, not saying that every objection is an emotional attachment, but more often than not, I find that it is more, has more to do with uh, frustration, emotion, hurt, pain, than it actually does a uh, rejection of the faith, if that makes, am I making sense? That's, first of all, you've stated it very clear, clearly and correctly. For every person who has a, who's really based on their, where they're, Rejection of faith is based on reason and rational argument. For every person of that kind, there are probably five or 10 who reject the faith because of emotional linkages with the faith in some way that, that hurt them or disappointed them or bothered them. Mm -hmm. And then and they I, rationalize it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's helpful to note, especially doing apologetics, because it's the discipline uh, usually of reason 
And so it is kind of trying to engage people with different arguments. But if the relationship or the the reason is more emotional, reason reason arguments often don't don't help at all. That's right. They don't. They can. Uh, uh, so the only answer you can show to someone who is really uh, consciously or unconsciously upset and angry at at the church or at God or at the faith, the only real response you can show that person is to be loving toward them. Uh, that is to be emotionally supportive and positive and not condemning. Um, I'm sure our Lord would not have condemned atheists if he came across them explicitly at the time of the scriptures, but uh, he wouldn't condemn them for many things that probably separated them from the faith because he, he knew that underneath there were these emotional issues. And uh, so we're not here to condemn atheists. Otherwise, I'd have to condemn even myself in my past life, which I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but we are there to... Uh, if we can't show arguments in favor of, the, of that are convincing, we have to still show them uh, human support and respect and uh, and kindness. Mm -hmm. That's extremely helpful. Um, one of the things that I loved about um, how you started the book is you talked about the different aspects of how um, psychologists like Floyd have thought about attachments to parents. Um, yes. why, why was it important for you to start off that way? Well, Freud was the major, he, first of all, he was the founder of what we call psychotherapy. Uh, you know, he invented the, the so-called talking cure. And so most psychotherapists would admit that and say they owe that to Freud. There are a lot of things we reject in Freud, but that's certainly one we've accepted. And so Freud was also famous for his rejection of the faith. And he said, you, we rejected God uh, because God was a, a projection of what we wanted in an, an ideal sense. But of course, Freud's own father was one of his big disappointments in his own life. And it was Freud himself who said that nothing is more common than for an adolescent to lose their faith in God when they lose their respect for their father mm. so he never followed that up he never followed that up but he said it <laughs> mm -hmm. wrote it mm -hmm. wrote it and he said a lot of interesting things he never followed up so other people can pick them up and mm -hmm. deal with them when we think about um the attachment between um the fa fatherlessness and atheism what made you start start to research that? What what was the catalyst for you saying, man, there's a connection here? Well, I happened to be doing some reading about the uh, childhood uh, experiences and childhood life of many famous atheists. And I noticed how unpleasant and, or absent their fathers were. And so I began to look at it systematically. And... Um, in a way, I you know I sum, summarize it. The most, the best case I came across. I mean, the almost unbelievably perfect case was Nietzsche, and Friedrich Nietzsche is famous for his statement that God is dead. But really, what it meant was that Dad is dead for Nietzsche, and therefore he looked for a substitute for God. His father represented God. His father was a minister, and he was very close to his father as a young child. Uh, but his father died, got sick and weak and, and very weak for a while and then died when Nietzsche was about five. And he looked for a substitute for his father all his life. And he, the substitute that he found was the, you know, the Superman, the Übermensch. That's finally the man that he could say could replace his father and replace God. Uh, because his father, although he loved him, was weak physically weak and died, and he never had any father substitute. So it was very interesting to see how Nietzsche represented the, the case, perhaps in the strongest way. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I say, you know, he, it's not God who's dead, it's your dad who's dead. 
And by the way, there are two kinds of atheists, or more than two, but two big kinds. The biggest kind, uh, kind that most people think about are the aggressive intellectual atheists, and there, there are a fair number of them. But there are a lot of people who are just atheists by default. They're not intellectual. They're not just your average truck driver who's an atheist. And so they may be atheists, again, because of bad fathers, but they're not writing about it. They're not making a thing about it. They're just God is absent from their life, so they're functionally atheists. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating about when you were talking about how fatherlessness manifests in belief was you talked about it being two ways in atheism or kind of this abstract view of God where he's kind of out there somewhere, kind of a mystical, but not like a person in relationship. Um, I do think that's fascinating, especially for, because when I think of atheism in, in correlation to the African-American context, there's not, atheism doesn't thrive in African-American contexts um, in, in, in a, in a, in a major way, like it does in uh, maybe Europe, Europeans or, or white Americans. Um, but there is still, um, a, there is fatherlessness in the African-American context. So I thought it was interesting how kind of most of the people you covered were, were white, but in still, when I think about my context in the African-American space, to think about how mysticism and kind of a new age spirituality um, manifests in different ways that may co correlate to this. Am I make, are, are you following my train of thought? Yes, I, I think, look, I, I think a lot African-Americans tend to be, uh, uh, are we both are here now? Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Because I can't see you. Yeah, I changed it to the solo view. So it would just be on you. Oh, oh okay, 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 okay. Um, African Americans can be atheists in the sense that, for them, if their father was distant and unknown, then it makes God distant and unknown. So they're not exactly atheists, but they, God is not real for them. God is not a person that they have a relationship with, and that's the essence of uh, of that's functional atheism, but not an active aggressive kind of. It's not an intellectual atheism, it's just functional atheism. And I know a fair number of, of, uh, of, of men for whom they don't, wouldn't say I'm an aggressive atheist, but God doesn't figure in my life, is how they put it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more common in the African-American community mm -hmm. among men. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, uh, some believers some of the best Christians I've ever met are, are African-American and not just African-American women. I've met some African-American men that are just terrific on their faith. But so they know, I mean, God is a possible source of help for all of us. And African-Americans know that um, perhaps better than many. And so they're not so actively, aggressively rejecting God, but there's still plenty who, who just, he doesn't figure in their life. He's just not, not present. Mm -hmm. That's extremely helpful. Um, one of the things I love that you split up how this affects men and women in different ways. Yeah. Um, can you talk about, can you talk about the difference there? Yeah, women so, often have a different kind of atheism in quotes. They may reject Jesus or God uh, and God the Father in particular, but they're more likely to have a, another relationship that takes its place. Um, usually, you know, they might have a, a feminist will sometimes pick a goddess, so they're not atheists. They have a, a different uh, div divinity in their life. Sometimes they have new age relationships, such as channeling with a person or some spirit so they still have a kind of religious relationship in their life because relationship is so important for women and somewhat less important for men. So men tend to either uh, reject uh, religion because they reject God for intellectual reasons or they reject God because they reject obedience and they reject him emotionally, perhaps unconsciously. 
But women, when they reject, say, God, uh, the Father, or reject Jesus, usually find another kind of uh, divine or another, another kind of higher order faith to replace it. So they don't, they're not as just plain atheists so much. They just reject Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's, that's fascinating. Um, it's also fascinating. I was talking to a friend recently and she mentioned that um, she, uh, she's Presbyterian and she said the reason, but she grew up in an intense trauma situation. And she said the reason why Presbyterian, um, that denomination was so attractive is because it's more uh, systematized. And um, because of her growing up in intense trauma and everything was chaotic, a faith that's extremely systematized is, is life-giving. Um, and I thought that yeah. was- and there's that chaos, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very, I, look, that's a new one for me, but very interesting. That's a new, uh, new response that I find very interesting. So good for her. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are other kinds of atheists too. One of the things that's interesting is that there's evidence now that autistic children tend to be uh, atheistic. And if you know, now autistic children are three out of four of them tend to be males. Uh, it's more common with men to be autistic. And of course, autistic uh, children, autistic adults, have trouble with relationships. Sometimes they have trouble understanding other people have minds and uh, they they don't have even sometimes especially good relationships even with their parents sometimes. But of course, if you don't, if you're not good at relationships, you're not going to be uh, very good as a Christian because Christianity is about a personal relationship, uh, especially with Jesus, but also with God. So, but there are also people who are atheists because the, the, the tendency for autistic, autistic children to, is to be atheists because, but, you know, the faith is based on a relationship. It's, it, it, it does need systematic explanation, but it also needs a living relationship. And that's what it is for most serious believers. Mm -hmm. When you talk about your own, um, your own experience with atheism, what was it? Uh, for you that was the catalyst for you adopting atheism and also what was the catalyst for you um, really um, coming to this place where you realize there is a God? Well, I was raised in a very um, sort of weak Protestant uh, type of environment. So the faith was never strong in the family or in, in uh, when I was growing up. Um, and then I went off to college and, you know, college is when you decide to be a big time rebel or something like that, or at least a small time rebel. And at the time I was kind of mad at my father for a variety of reasons. So that was, and so, uh, I read Bertrand Russell and I said, oh, I don't need anybody. I I'm like Bertrand Russell. There's nobody there, but us, and we live in a meaningless world and it's all very dark and it, granted, when we die, it's all over, but I'm tough enough to live that way, and uh, I don't need anybody or any support, and, you know, that kind of late adolescence, I'm, I'm tough, I don't need any help, I, I you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to live alone and enjoy it and be brave and courageous and something like that, I guess. And uh, then after a while, it just uh, faded a little bit into just general skepticism and unbelief. And of course, I went to graduate school in psychology. And the first thing you discover there is that if you have religion they, at that time, at any rate, not so much now, but then they figured if you were religious, you were still sort of not grown up and were still sort of immature. And religion was not uh, appreciated at all. And in general was criticized and rejected. So I wanted to become a professional psychologist. So like anybody joining a profession, I decided to pick up some of their attitudes and ideas so that I fit in. So there I was at, at graduate school at Stanford and um, in an atheistic skeptical environment. So I, I started 
shall we say, keeping the same beliefs and attitudes as my professors and most of my fellow students had. And uh, I was that way when I went to my first major job, uh, which was an assistant professor at New York University. So I go to New York City and NYU, I'm still that kind of skeptic. And um, then, well, a big wake up call, the first wake up call was I got married. And, but my wife at the time was also an atheist, perhaps even a bigger atheist or more feisty atheist at the time than I was. And uh, so that wouldn't have looked like a very good situation for uh, change. So we got married in 1969. We made uh, up our own marriage vows. Uh, no reference to God was made. We found a very liberal minister who would marry us, even though God wasn't mentioned. Uh, God came anyway, as it turned out, <laughs> but oh. we, didn't, we didn't know that. And uh, so we were married in 1969. Um, now, my wife was a... a French literature was her, she was in the French department at NYU, a little bit younger than me. And um, we went to France in 1970. And for, for atheists, we spent an awful lot of time sort of around beautiful medieval cathedrals. But still, we were atheists. And then in 1971, our first child was born. And, and at least for me, and I think for many men, it's a bigger wake up call when you have a child than when you get married. Uh, all of a sudden, here's this child, our daughter. And the question is, you know, I'm gonna know her all my life. You know, you don't take them back if they're, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't really. So here's our daughter, beautiful little baby. And what do I stand for? What, who, who am I? And so by 1971 or so, that began to be an issue for me. And there weren't very many things that you could believe in then. I'm not sure now whether there are many more or not. I don't think so. But anyway, at the time, you could be you could be either you could be an atheist. But the atheists had there was one person most what atheists did worship. They usually worshipped themselves. That is, their self became the center of their whole life. And the only idol they had was their own career, their own self-advancement, their own making money, their own getting power, their own, you know, having sex all the time or whatever. It was what they wanted. And so they were really worshiping themselves. Well, by that time, somehow or other, I was aware that anybody who worships himself is worshiping a fool. Uh, we're all kind of unreliable, even to ourselves. So I started looking around. And there weren't many choices. You could continue being the atheist self-worshipper, but as, as I said, I didn't think that was a, a good fit. Well, you could go, you could become uh, a liberal, liberal politics was one opening. Another opening was new age. And I had been in, you know, in California, close to some of the new age founders and all of that. And I was not impressed with them and their lives. And it seemed to me that the New Agers were always changing what they thought of as New Age so that it would fit them what they wanted. It was a kind of spiritual narcissism where they were always picking the parts they wanted, like a tourist traveling to one Eastern religious country after another and just picking the parts they wanted. So New Age didn't appeal. And liberal politics was, that's, that didn't seem like a religion. It seemed like, well, that's, that's a practical issue, I guess. And so the only other alternative that was left was traditional religion. And I sort of groaned when I saw that it was left, but I figured I should look into it. And I began to notice that every now and then I heard that people would be quoted, they'd quote, oh, the Pope, or they'd quote Billy Graham or somebody like that. And I, I found myself believing what, what was being said. I mean, I, mean I, I thought what they said was true, but I couldn't believe it. That's a funny position for an atheist to hear something they know they're pretty sure is true, but they can't believe it. And so I began looking around for why you might believe it. And I had to, I discovered people, one of the people I discovered, <laughs> and 
not exactly me was the person who first discovered him by, by any means, but I discovered C.S. Lewis. I'd never heard of him. Here I was a PhD and a professor in a psychology department. I'd never heard of C.S. Lewis. And I thought I was educated. In fact, I hadn't been educated in the very good cases that can be made for for belief and in, in, for being a Christian. There's a lot of very intelligent uh, argument and evidence for the faith. But of course, I'd never been exposed to that. And here I was arrogantly confident. I was, you know, a professor, so I knew everything. And of course, I didn't know much at all, really. And I discovered how much I had not been taught. And so I discovered C.S. Lewis and Malcolm Muggeridge and G.K. Chesterton and a whole bunch of other people, Billy Graham. And uh, I began to realize that there, was, there were no serious intellectual barriers to uh, being a Christian. There, there, there might be other barriers and maybe one didn't want to do it. And one problem with being a Christian, of course, is it costs you time and money. And I didn't think I had enough of either of those. You know, you got to go to church, you got to go to Bible study, you got to give money to the poor, you got to help other people. I didn't know where I was going to find the time or the money for that. But slowly but surely, um, it became clearer to me. And, and the other thing was that somehow or other with my wife, Timmy, now her, her rejection to the faith was also emotional, what you mentioned, Lisa. She hadn't really quite confronted it, but it was, and she knew it when we talked about it. When she grew up, her father was the religious parent, and she would go to church with her, with her father, and she loved to sing hymns and to sit by him in church. But um, when she was 16, in, in, she was in high school and was in class, she was called home because of a family emergency. Her father who suffered from depression and had committed suicide with a shotgun in their house, in their basement. And she noticed that two or three years later when she was in college as a freshman, she noticed she hadn't gone to church for ever since then. And so it was her father's suicide that was the emotional block to returning to, to the faith. And somehow or other becoming a mother and being married and my presence with her had allowed that to drop off some. And so we started this journey together. And it took us some years before we finally came back to the faith and uh, came to where we were, uh, what we are now, uh, serious Christians, and eventually we became Catholics. But I was helped along the way by some wonderful evangelical Protestants who picked up my work sooner than the Catholic world long shot. And they were extraordinarily supportive and have always been very important in my life. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an extremely powerful story. When you when you were in that, um, and I, I really thank you for sharing that because I think a lot of people will be blessed and helped by that. When you were in that state of, you know, intense atheism or just uh, unbelief in God, as a professor, I think it's fascinating because when a lot of people get shaken in their faith, it's from their professors. Um, I remember yeah. my own story. And the assumption is that a person has a PhD, they know everything. So they rattle you with the PhD and you kind of go along with it. But I, I'm, it, what's so fascinating is you're saying like you were a professor and you're like, I didn't really know that the the other argument on the other side um That's and, you were, right. you were, and you were educated at the most and some of the best institutions in the world um so i think it's is very interesting um that you shared that because i think a lot of people get intimidated especially students when they go in a in a, in a classroom at a university and they're like i believe in this but my professor has a phd i don't have a phd i'm just a student they know more yeah. than me, um, and they get rattled. So I think that's helpful for you to, to share. And one of the reasons, of course, why I mentioned it, I also just discovered that, and like some of those evangelical Protestants that I discovered, they were terribly intelligent. One was, um, uh, um, he's now, I think, uh, retired, but uh, 
Professor Alvin Planting, a very powerful philosopher and, and, a and was the president of the American Philosophical Association for one year. And he was a serious believer, um, Protestant. And I, he was, I, I met him briefly at Calvin College very early in my Christian life. And I also met there several other very young, uh, marvelous young faculty members who were Christians. So I began to realize that uh, intelligence isn't the issue as to why uh, you are or are not a believer. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. And I think it's also helpful to note that um, I think people, many students go into academia or college not understanding the discipline of academia. So a PhD in, in theology doesn't make you an expert at theology. Um, sure <laughs> it, it, may you, it may make you less of an expert than the student by a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so dear student, don't don't discount your own knowledge. You may know more about what, what the professor's supposedly talking about than he does. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's extremely, extremely helpful. When you talked about political atheism, can you share a little bit about what what uh, what that is? Well, I was just thinking here mostly of uh, communism, and uh, and sometimes libertarianism. Uh, those are political positions, which are also rooted in atheism. Communism is. Uh, many libertarians tend to be atheist because they don't want any, you know, they want total autonomy. It's a form of, I think, self-worship, a form of self-deification to uh, reject any kind of dependency on, on others. We, we are dependent uh, and there's no way around it, however much it might offend some of us. Uh, just uh, look at a baby with a mother. You know, the idea of a self-made man, uh, you know, just ask his mother. You know, somebody took care of him and changed his diapers and everything else and fed him for years before he was on his own. And you'd think people would wake up to the need we have for other people in, in our lives and that that need is um, foundational to our own flourishing. We, we, we need people. And those people, we need people in our life who help us and whom we help. And that's the essence of flourishing. It's not separating yourself from all, all other people. That's the goal of life. That ends up being a kind of downward, isolated spiral, I think. But anyway, um, that's the, it's libertarianism and um, communism are sort of the most common political forms of uh, atheism. One of the things you mentioned in the close of your book that I think is helpful because we live in a culture that pushes uh, a grind culture where you always got to be on the go. And you talk about how atheism sometimes is rooted in ambition. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you can you speak about that? Because I think as a young professional and also I mean, you're in the DMV area. So, you know, that's a very ambitious culture. You were in New York. So that's the kind of go getter, you know, accumulate all you can, get as high as you can in your career, all that. Um, how does that contribute to atheism? Well, it, uh, if you're really ambitious, uh, atheism, look, ambition is, means you're very focused on yourself. Now, there are different kinds of ambition. You can be ambitious to have money, so you want to become a billionaire. You can be ambitious to build a company and you want to become, you know, head of a tech company. You can be ambitious to get ahead in, in, in the media or in the arts. But normally the ambitious person is somebody who is somewhat insecure personally and wants to satisfy that insecurity by a big achievement. And that person is already so self-focused, it's hard for them to be able to relate to God and to relate to others. I mean, to truly love others and to, and to sacrifice anything in their own life for another person. So the very ambitious person is often very um, atheistic, at least in practice, if not in theory, and sometimes often both in theory and in practice. And I was quite ambitious as an academic. I wanted to succeed, become a full professor and 
you know, write books, become well known as a psychologist and all of that kind of stuff. And I saw that, uh, that atheism was a kind of safe spot to keep from offending people who might stand in your way and wouldn't help you achieve. In other words, it was the best policy for getting ahead in my career, in my profession. And so many people become sort of atheists because they want to get ahead in their profession and they don't want to have be held up by uh, their religious beliefs and their religious life. That is extremely, extremely fascinating and helpful um, when we think about atheism. Um, I want to close with this question. Um, I think a lot of people think of atheism, as you, as you said, as this intellectually rigorous discipline. But atheism, I think practical atheism is, is most seen in churches where people go to church every week. Um, and still function as as practical atheists. Um, do you, do you see that amongst people that you've you've counseled, or just your intersection, your your research between faith and and um, and and psychology? Well, there are um, there are people who go to church and are don't behave like Christians once they leave, and uh, they, these are people who have. Adapted to the world, you have to be a light to the world and salt for seasoning, and that means they have to be different from the world. Uh, you can't be of the world if you're going to be a light to it, and you can't be of the world if you're going to be the seasoning for it. And salt both preserves, keeps things from spoiling, and adds taste. But one thing about being a Christian is, if we're going to be salt and light. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be a Christian because you don't want the whole world to be all salt. You don't want the whole world to be all light. Uh, the rest of the world has to, we have to be the messengers to the rest of the world. And unfortunately, you're right. Many ordinary Christians uh, just go to church for who knows, some kind of small positive reasons, but they don't show up as Christians once they get home again. And that's a kind of uh, behavioral atheism that's uh, not theoretical. They're not, you, they wouldn't call themselves atheists, but they don't behave any different from many atheists. So we do have to behave differently. We have to be more loving. We have to be more helpful to others. We have to be a light. We have to uh, be a seasoning and a preservative for the culture. That's extremely helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Vitz, for your time. How can people get your book and how can they get in contact with you? Oh, well, I don't know about contact with me. I got a lot of emails. Social, on this. social media? <laughs> I have. Look, if you want the book, you can just go to Amazon and get it. You can order it from uh, the publisher, which is Ignatius Press or Amazon. Um, and as I said, I, I, I'm not there to condemn atheists since I was one. I'm there to reach out to them and to tell you, to tell atheists that the thing about being a serious believer is that it brings enormous meaning and peace to one's life. And it turns one away from a focus on your own self to focusing on others. Um, that's the, the, the main thing. That is, the two great commandments are there. We are to love God and love others. Uh, and we love others as we accept ourselves as being worthwhile too because we're children of God just like everybody else uh, I don't think I want to give you my email <laughs> no uh, that's you know, not I, I about contact I was talking about um if you're on social media like Facebook Instagram Twitter well, no I'm I, I I'm I'm an old geezer that way I'm not on <laughs> Facebook I'm not on Twitter I'm not on any of those things um and it, it's made my life uh, more peaceful. But at the same time, <laughs> it means I'm not so with it. I'm not so with it as all the young people like those in my family. I have a lot of young people who do those things, my children and my grandchildren. But so far I've remained outside of the, of the social media. I gotcha. I, I completely 
I completely understand it could be time consuming and draining mentally. So <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and I have enough good relationships, you know, already. So I don't need to make new friends. Although <laughs> it's always nice to have a couple of new ones too. Awesome. Well, well, thank you. Lisa, yeah, you know, Lisa, you're a terrific young lady and, and um, don't let anybody ever tell you anything otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I really <laughs> enjoyed, enjoyed this time and I, I love your book. So thank you for writing it and make sure y'all go pick up this Faith of the Fatherless. Um, it will help you in understanding and being more gracious um, when you understand people's story and how they got to their conclusion. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. And by the way, there's some of the new atheists that I've heard since I wrote the book that have also fit the pattern. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I write a, a third edition or something, I'll put them in. But right now, it, it doesn't look likely. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, you can catch all our past episodes on iTunes, Spotify, wherever podcasts are, YouTube, Facebook. Um, remember, you can get our new curriculum through Eyes of Color, a contextualized guide to help you know what you believe and why you believe it at g3project.com. You could get g3project.org, I'm sorry. You get our merch there as well. And you can take our online course and you can also donate. Um, every gift helps equip. Thank you so much for listening here at the G3 Project. We're helping you to know what you believe and why you believe it. Thank you.